we just come before you, God, this morning, Lord. Ready to praise you, God. Ready to lift up our voices, Lord. Ready to glorify your name. And Lord, we just pray that you would awaken us in this moment, Lord. You would empty our minds, God, that we'd be able to focus completely on you. Shout out. 
Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. Good morning. Good morning, everybody outside in the courtyard. Glad you're all here. Can't see you, but I know you're there. Just wanted to make sure you know I know that you know that I know that you're out there. <laughs> so you're not forgotten. You're not forgotten. All right. I almost feel like this is my first time back to teaching Sunday morning, even though I was here last Sunday after coming back from Africa. 
but I was able to share last Sunday about my trip to Africa. Now this is the first Sunday I get back into the Word, so that's why I feel like that, because I'm excited about the Word and continuing on in Corinthians. And it, You know what I find so strange sometimes is you're going through the Word like this, and you hit chapters, you know, uh, three or four chapters before you're going to end, and you're already looking forward to the next book you're in, but you're not even done yet. You know, and it's like, oh, I want to get in the next book, but finish the book you're in first. You know, so I've got to, I've got to stay focused here. So, uh, if you have a bulletin, pull it out. If you don't, raise your hand, and they will get you one. They will get you one there, so you can follow along with us. We have a few announcements, not a whole lot going on. <clears throat> Discipleship meeting is this coming Monday at November fourth, which is my granddaughter's birthday. She'll be twenty. This coming uh, Monday, she just got married, so I've lost one, another one, um, and she moved away to Texas, it makes it worse. <laughs> That's Gabby, yeah, yeah, she's, she's gone, so I'll see her in heaven, or if I ever go to Texas, <laughs> which is probably heaven first before I go to Texas. <laughs> So class is this coming Monday at 6.30 here at the church if you'd like to join us for the discipleship class. Men's conference is coming up the 9th. That is this coming Saturday. I'd like to carpool, so if you want to go, let me know so we can get a count of how many guys want to go. We're going to see if we can get some vehicles to carpool out there. I know of at least uh, five or so. So we have a couple of cars. We'll probably need another one and we'll carpool out there. So let me know today. If not, text me a, a message so I know that you're going to go. And it's from 8 o'clock to 4 o'clock, so it's an all-day event. We'll probably leave sharply, if not before 7 in the morning, so we get there, get parking, and then get in line. If, if it is like it usually is, and I'm hoping that it is, there's going to be a long line, and it's in the main convention center there, and there's going to be a lot of guys. So it's going to be exciting to see what the Lord has to do. And a lot of the speakers are the up-and-coming generation. Uh, they're no longer the generation of, of Pastor Chuck's kids, you know. They were just uh, called right under him, the Greg Lorries and Mike McIntoshes and so forth. Those guys are getting old along with me, of course. Um, but the next generation is taking the baton, and we're praying that God will just continue to reach this nation. Amen. The gospel of Jesus Christ. So hopefully you can join us next Saturday. The uh, Christmas uh, boutique. boutique is also on November 9th from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. So you can see Christina if you need any more information. Christina, She's not Christian. You put Christian on. Oh, Christian. Okay, so you can see Christina <laughs> Mendez. And the cost is $15 if there's still spots open. There is still spots open, but I need them to stop paying now for those that signed up. Oh, yeah. That's important. Start paying now. If you haven't, uh, put it in today. Otherwise, you won't have a spot next week, okay? Please let me know. <laughs> All right. Thanksgiving lunch. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the foyer area. We're going we're, we're gonna to look and see how many sign up uh, for our Thanksgiving outreach to the homeless and the community here. It always goes well every year. We usually feed anywhere from 100 to 200 people that come out for lunch here at the church. Now, our... Harvest Carnival was a success. Mm -hmm. We had probably anywhere from three to 400 people here Easy. at the church, just still in place. They were just kind of coming in and going uh, in early 5.30, and then by the time it ended at 8.30 or so. But it was a lot of work. It was a lot of work for the size of our church at this moment. Last year, I think we had more than that because we had more people here in the church. So I know that it's a lot of work, I know it takes commitment and sacrifice on so many parts um, of your lives. So I want to be sensitive to that. And I know that Thanksgiving is a special day for a lot of people. So we really need to know if, if you're in, if you're in, and if you're not, you're not. Don't sign up if you're not in it. Because we need to know so, so that we can host this uh, event for the community. I really believe, and you've heard me say this before, that God has called this church called myself and my wife to be servants to our community. And that means sacrificing our own wants and desires. That's what Christianity is all about. I know some Christians don't get that. 
Uh, they don't want to serve. They don't want to be involved. They just want to come sit down and listen to the message and then leave. But we're an active church in our community, and we're active in the lives of the homeless and those that are in need of food and any other resources that we can possibly help them with or direct them to. Mm -hmm. That's just our heart. Mm -hmm. So if you can join us in that, we'd love to have you. If not, that's fine too. We love you. We're not asking you to leave at all. If you don't get that thought in your mind, I'm asking you to leave because I know some people leave mm -hmm. when they see what's going on here. And unfortunately, uh, that's sad because this is exactly what Jesus would be doing. Mm -hmm. He would. He would break all cultural rules and all traditions and so forth. And yeah. if you celebrate, and I'm not saying you have to, but if you celebrate Thanksgiving and Thanksgiving, Jesus would say, let's go feed the homeless. Mm -hmm. you know, let's go do something different. And then that's what we're trying to do here. So that will be November 28th, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. And the, the sign-up sheet will be out in the FOIA area on the sign-up desk. Youth night, Friday, November 8th, here at the church at 6.30 p.m. So invite the youth. If you know any of the youth, your neighbors and so forth, let them know. Um, I think we might have some flyers, grab some flyers from Carlos, and um, hopefully we get to build up our youth. And then it is Sunday is Youth Day. They'll be running the whole church, uh, setting up and so forth, as you know, and even uh, preparing the food for fellowship. So keep them in prayer as God continues to minister to our, our young people here. So let's go ahead and ask the ushers to come forward and give our, our tithe and our offerings. To the Lord. <clears throat> Let's pray. Oh, gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to give back to you, Father. Lord, your scriptures are clear from Genesis all the way to Revelation that there's a certain part of our resources that belongs to you, Lord. They've always been yours. They've never been ours. Uh, we get the opportunity to be stewards of those resources. And the first part that we do, Lord, is like any first fruits, Lord, we give it unto you. And so, Lord, we pray that you receive our tithes, our 10%. And, Lord, that you would bless us because of it. And, Lord, because you promised us in Malachi, Lord, that you would bless us. You promised us in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, Lord, that if we sow abundantly, we'll reap abundantly, Lord. So we're praying, Lord, that as we tithe, Lord, that you would give us more resources to tithe with, Lord. Bless those that tithe, Father. And Lord, bless the offerings. Of those, Lord, that are giving of their offerings to the Lord, whatever those offerings are, the whatever amount it is, Lord, may you bless them, Lord God, and provide for them also, Lord. And Lord, we pray you bless your word as it go forth today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Okay, let's turn our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand and they will, they will get you a Bible so that you can follow along with us. We are a Bible teaching church. Amen. And I, and I love going through each verse, even in the Greek. So we will look at the Greek of the text so that we get the full meaning of what uh, Paul is saying to us uh, as he writes to the Corinthian believers. We know that uh, Paul is writing to this church in Corinth, and this church is very carnal. What does carnal mean? That means they're fleshly. Everything they do is by their flesh, how they feel. Oh, I feel like going over here and doing this. I don't feel like doing that. So I'm going to do this because I feel good about it. That's how they run their daily walk. Well, I, just, I feel good about going to church this morning. I'm going to go to church. Oh, I don't feel really like going to church today. So I'm not going to go to church today. So everything they do is by feelings and by emotions. So saying that, Christians are not to live their lives by feelings and emotions. We're to walk by faith and not by sight. The Bible is very clear about that. We're to walk by faith. Christianity is all based upon faith. Our faith in Jesus Christ and our faith in Him to get us through this life until we get to heaven by faith. Even our salvation is by 
faith. We walk by faith. We live by faith. We breathe by faith. It's all faith. So everything we do is faith. We take a step of faith. I don't know how many times somebody has shared with me, oh, I really didn't want to go to church this morning. didn't feel like it. But I went ahead and I did it by faith. And then when I got here, man, I was so blessed. I'm glad I came. You know, and I hear that all the time. I don't want to go to the men's retreat, but I'm so glad I came. You know, it was by faith. Go by feelings and you're going to lose. Boy, will you lose because your feelings will take you all over the place, won't they? Yeah. Huh. They just mislead you. And that's what's happening with the Corinthian believers. It's all by feelings. I like this guy. He really makes me feel good. I like the way he teaches. I love the way he, he expounds on the word of God. And, you know, I hear that even in Calvary Chapel. I love this pastor and that pastor. And I'm of this pastor over here in this area and in that pastor. Instead of, I'm of Jesus Christ. I just want to hear the word of God. I just want to know him. And I want to serve him wherever God has led me to. So Paul is dealing with this church that is all about feelings. And feely, feely, feely. And I know that, that all of us get that way. I get that way. There are times where I don't feel like coming to church. It's like this morning after the time change, you know. Even though I got another extra hour, I'm like, I still need another hour. My body still hasn't adjusted. And I, I had to wake up and say, okay, just get up and go. Get up and go. And we have to do that by faith. This morning's theme is Jesus, our rock. Now, I changed the theme, and I, I, don't know, I don't need to let you know this, but I thought I would anyway. I changed the theme because I did have the faithless. And, and, and after looking at it this morning, I'm thinking, if I were going across a list of studies and I saw this title, The Faithless, I don't think I'd want to listen to that message. <laughs> you know? Like, why do I want to know about the faithless? You know? And so I thought, you know, I need to change that to Jesus, our rock. And Paul's going to talk about that, the fact that Jesus is our rock. And because he's our rock, we don't have to be faithless. <laughs> Though Paul is dealing with the faithless here in these few chapters in Corinthians, um, which we will deal with, the faithless, and how not to be faithless, but how to be people of faith. So Jesus is our rock. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Amen. Let me give you an introduction here. When Jesus was on a mountain, probably the Mount of Olives there, and he was looking down at Jerusalem, he had this sense of compassion and love for them, and yet a fear, a fear and a worry, if he worried for Jerusalem. And he said this in Luke 13, 34, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who continue to kill the prophets and to stone those who are sent to you, how often I have desired and yearned to gather your children together around me as a hen gathers her young under her wing. But you would not. You would not. Behold, your house is forsaken, abandoned, left you desolate of God's help. Wow. Isn't that sad? He says, I tell you, you will not see me again until the time comes when you shall say, Blessed or to be celebrated with praise, he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now he's speaking to the nation Israel as a whole here, and not to individuals. And what he's saying is, Israel, you are rejecting the Messiah. And how sad, because I have sent prophets, I've sent teachers, I have sent before, even John the Baptist, and yet you have rejected, rejected, rejected. And because you have rejected me, I will reject you. That principle of rejection. Same principle that we see in the Old Testament with the children of Israel when they were to go into the promised land. And God says, I've given it to you. No question about it. Don't even ask. Just go in and take it. And yet when they got to that border, they would not go in because they doubted. They were faithless. And so God told that group of people they would wander for 40 years before the next generation would enter in. So there's a repercussion in being faithless. And that's one of the points I want to make this morning is that we need to be people of faith. The heart of Jesus is to have deep fellowship with mankind. This is not a religion. It's not a religion. And sometimes even as Christians, we think it's a religion. Oh, I, I have to go to church. I have to. No, you get to go to church, guys. Right. We get to go to church. God gives us that. He's opened up our eyes and our hearts that we would desire to go to church. And if you're thinking that I've got to go to church, then you are in a religious system. You've created your own religious system and you need to get out of that. You need to change that mindset. You need to stop thinking that way. Oh, I have to do this. I have to do that. I have to. No, stop it. 
I get to do this. I get to do. I get to read my Bible. I get to pray. I get to fellowship. I get to participate in the kingdom of God. Not I have to. I have to. Because when you say I have to, that's almost like saying I don't want to. Mm-hmm. And if you don't want to, then why are you a Christian? Yeah. Why have you asked Christ into your heart? Why do you want him in your life <laughs> if you don't really want it? And see, that's religion. And you're just hoping, well, if I go and that work is good enough, because even though I don't want to and I have to, well, maybe he'll bless me. No, he won't. He won't do that because your heart's there. Jesus wants a deep, intimate relationship with you. He wants to spend time with you. He wants you to get to know him because he already knows you. And that takes time and effort and prayer. Jeremiah said, but if you will not hear these words, I swear by myself, says the Lord, that this house shall become desolation. And that's what religion does. It desolates you. It's a work-based relationship with God, and it does not work. It will fail. Hebrews says, without faith, you are unable to please God. And those who please God in chapter 11 of Hebrews have works within the kingdom of God and not their own kingdom. That's important to understand. Hebrews chapter 11 is very clear. Without faith, you're unable to please God. That's very clear. You want to please God? Have faith. Don't be faithless. Trust in Him. Know that He's going to do a work. Know that He's leading you. Know that He's guiding you. Know that He's God and He has your best interest. And you have to believe that He's going to do something wonderful. Otherwise, it's faithlessness. And if you believe and have faith in God, then you'll have works that are evidence of that. Hebrews 11 is filled with these prophets who had faith in God. Then they did works. And they recounted them as righteousness, the Bible says. Read it. Read that chapter. It's a great chapter. It shows you that as believers, we are to be believers in faith, and then we're to have works that show forth that faith. James tells us that very clearly. I'll share with you a little quick analogy of that, one that I've shared before, and I think it's one that's great. Back uh, years ago in the early, what, uh, I, I think it's right, uh, 60s or 70s, there was uh, this, this fascination with tight roping, where, where you would take a rope and tight rope it across two buildings or, or like the uh, Niagara Falls, and then you would walk across on it to the other side. Well, this gentleman who was in tight roping back then decided he was going to do that. He put tight rope across Niagara Falls. And he got a crowd, and he began to walk across uh, on this little rope, you know, just, just like this with the stick, and he walked all the way across. And everyone's like, wow, this is wonderful. This is great. And the crowd got bigger, and he walked all the way back. And then he walked again, and the crowd got bigger and bigger. And then he says, can I take a wheelbarrow? Do you think, you think I can take a wheelbarrow with me? And they're like, yeah, you can do it. They had faith that he could do it, because they just saw him type rope. So their faith was that he could do it. Got a wheelbarrow, walked it across, came back. He goes, isn't that wonderful? Yeah. He says, you think I can carry someone in the wheelbarrow? You think I can carry someone in there and take them across and then bring them back? And they're like, of course you can. We've seen you do this over and over. He says, okay, well, why don't you get in? <laughs> oh. Well, that's, that's, where, that's where you realize, do I really have faith or do I not have faith? Because if you really had faith, you'd say, I'll get in and I have no worries that you will take me across and bring me back. How many of you would, here would really do that? No, be honest. No, I don't know if I would. I think I would just to prove that I had faith. Because I'm stubborn like that. I'm just stubborn like that. And if I die, then I go to heaven. But that, guys, that is the evidence of our faith is when we have works that show forth. Because we can say until we're blue in the face, sitting on the earth while he's walking across, oh no, I have total faith in you. Total faith. And yet you don't exercise it. And yet we exercise faith all the time, don't we? All of you exercise faith this morning. You all came in here by faith. And you all sat in those chairs by faith without even thinking about it. You didn't all of a sudden get the chair and go, is this going to hold me up? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm wondering if that's going to hold me up. And you just kind of barely sit and you hold on to the other chair. And like, okay, it'll help me up. No, you just plop down right on the chair. That's exercising faith because you've done it before. And it's been faithful to hold you up. Now, once in a while, a chair will not hold you up, right? And it breaks. You still exercise the faith, and the results were that you were a little too heavy, and the chair broke, or the chair was weak, and it broke. But it's not going to stop you from continuing to exercise that faith. Next time you come in here, you'll probably plop down in another chair. See, that's what faith does. It exercises. There's works. There's evidence of your faith. You do something. 
Because you have faith, you don't just sit there. Can you imagine if all of us did not have faith that these chairs would hold us? We'd all be standing the whole service. And I'd ask you, sit down. And like, no, I don't want to sit down. <laughs> Why not? Well, I don't know if that chair's going to hold me up. It will. No, no, I don't want to tell you to stand. And you'll go around life never sitting in a chair. Because you don't have faith that a chair will hold you up. It's designed to hold you up. Now, I'm exaggerating here, but I think I'm getting my point across to you. That if you say you believe in Jesus Christ by faith, then you have to have the evidence that you believe in Jesus Christ. And that stands in all of our livelihood. Whatever we do in life with Christ as Christians, we're to do it by faith. If you want to please God, you have to have faith. So when you give, you give out of constraint. You give because you have to. No, you give by faith. See, now faith says you give even though it looks like maybe you're not going to have yourself. But I'm going to trust God that he's going to take care of me. Amen. And so you exercise your faith by giving. Now those who don't have faith and they're faithless, they don't give. Right? Mm -hmm. They don't give. Why? Because they don't trust that God will take care of them. They don't trust that they have enough. And so they're depending on what they have, on their money. That's the love of money, which is the root of all evil. They're depending on their own thoughts and imaginations and knowledge and so forth. It's like Solomon said, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. And that word understanding in the Hebrew means your own narcissistic knowledge of things, rationalization. Lean not to none of that. Whoa, you're trying to throw that out the door? Yeah, and just have faith in Christ. Amen. By faith you can move Mountains. Anyone ever see a mountain move? Mm -hmm. I wonder how many mountains have moved through earthquakes because of someone's faith. We don't know. But one day, the mountains will move. God will get rid of them completely. So, in this chapter, Paul ends with running the race to win the prize or to be disqualified. There's only two places. You're either going to win or you're going to be disqualified. And that was the case with the children of Israel and with the Corinthians. They're at that crossroads. So he reminds the Corinthians that they are faced with some very dangerous situations and they better take care of their faith seriously. Reminding them about the example of Israel's apostate falling away from God and the danger of their own, he commands them to flee idolatry, verse 14. And he uses the Old Testament Israelites as an example for them. So the Old Testament was written for us as an example so that we don't fall into the same trap as they did. And we'll see that. Most of those who were delivered out of Egypt never entered the promised land. Isn't that sad? That you would see great miracles that Moses had performed by the hand of God, ten of them, and then the Red Sea opened up and yet you still couldn't trust in God. That's sad. That is sad. That we can't put our faith in God even after all the miracles in our own lives that we see happening from time to time. When I was in South Sudan, I got sick. And many of you know this, I think the couple of days. Well, I got there Monday, even though I left Saturday, because it's a long trip that way, about 22 hours just to get there. And when I got there Monday, Tuesday, I got sick. I, I had a fever of some sort that was like cooking, cooking me from the inside out. I don't know if it was malaria, yellow fever, or a parasite, or, or, or what. And so told Virginia about it, and I didn't know, but she goes, well, I'm praying for you. And I didn't know that there were other people praying, too. And by the time I woke up in the morning, I was fine. Amen. It was gone. Oh, you know, so now I had a choice. Oh, was it just the heat in the air, or was this something going on? And God really healed me. I think God healed me. Yeah. I think God wanted a work to be done, and he just took it all away. And I told the guys in the compound, they're like, wow, I've never heard of anything like that before. Usually you're sweating with a fever just outside, but being cooked inside like in the microwave, you know? I've never heard of that, but I think that was the enemy. You know, and maybe whatever it is that I was getting, God just put a stop to it. So it's by faith, though. I had to believe that by faith, and you had to believe it by faith, because you were praying for me, and it was probably your faith more than my faith that healed me at that moment, because I was sleeping or trying to get to sleep. And God honored that faith. So Paul's conclusion that we'll see might surprise his readers, but his style of argument would not, as ancient teachers rely heavily on past examples like the Israelites, especially from the sacred books, like Judaism, natural 
naturally draws examples from the scriptures. Now, if we don't study history, we'll repeat the same mistakes and faithfully, uh, greatly come to an end, just as history shows. So it's important to study history, right? It's important to study what has happened in the past so that we don't repeat ourselves. So let's go ahead and look at this text here, verses 1 through 5, as we see them. Three points, baptized under the cloud, Christ our rock, and then God not pleased. We'll read the text. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. <clears throat> Israel received blessings from the Lord while crossing the Red Sea. Well, in the wilderness, and still, God was displeased to the point where some were scattered in the wilderness and died. We can be displeasing to God while still being part of the body of Christ. You think that would be impossible because you're a part of a church, you're part of the body of Christ, but yet we can still be displeasing to Him. Were they still believers in Christ? They were under the cloud, they passed by the sea, they drank of the same water, and yet they displeased God. Were they believers? Do, do they sound like believers? How can you be a believer and yet be faithless like that? How can you still be under a cloud? How can you pass through the Red Sea with Moses? How can you drink of the living water that came forth from the rock and not be a believer and be displeasing to God? Now, I can't say with assurance, because the Bible doesn't say whether they were believers and they all got to go to heaven. We'll see when we get there. Whether they did or not, that's not up for us to decide. I know what John 15, uh, 1 through 5 says, that we need to abide in Him and He'll abide in us, which is important. If you ever question your salvation, it's easily remedied by just simply abiding in Christ. Get back to abiding in Christ, being faithful to Him. So Paul begins and says, Moreover, brethren, do not... Or I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud and passed through the sea. Now, in the Greek, Paul says it this way. I, Paul, do not desire you to continually be unaware. It was something that Paul was reminding them all the time. It wasn't just a one-time effort. No, he was constantly reminding them, I don't want you to be unaware. This is why I repeat myself. This is why I tell you these stories. This is why I give you this truth. Because I don't want you to be naive of these things. And he's emphasizing that point in the Greek. So he's saying, I don't want you to be unaware. I want you to understand. I want you to grasp this about faith. I really do. That's my heart. So don't just listen and then throw it out the door. He says, Christian uh, brethren Corinthians that our fathers were all under by, under or by the cloud and all passed through the sea in the past. And he's talking about the children of Israel in the past. This has already happened. We've heard the stories. We've read them in the Torah. We, we've heard the story of Moses and how the children of Israel were, were led by the cloud, how they were under it or by it. They were close by. They, were, uh, they could have almost touched it in a sense. That's how close they were to God. And then they went through the sea <clears throat> to walk through the sea with Moses and not be destroyed like Pharaoh and his army. See, the church in Corinth was a mixture of people from Jews to Gentiles. And in that day, the Gentiles Christian uh, was an unusual thing to have. There were first Jewish Christians, and so there were a few Gentile Christians, which Jesus said there would be, but it was unusual. And Paul's speaking here to the Jewish part of the church. And so they would understand what he is saying when he's talking about the children of Israel in history and what they went through. And Paul has been writing about the need to finish what God has set before them and how dangerous it is not to be willing to give up something that gets in the way of finishing God's work. We have to be willing to sacrifice, to 
give up, to stop living a certain way so that we can live a different way. That's what Christianity is about. Now, he will use Israel's experience in the Exodus from Egypt to illustrate that principle. He says, pass through the sea. All of Israel came through the Red Sea and saw God's incredible power in holding up the walls of the sea so Israel could cross through on dry ground. And then God's work of sending the water back down on the Egyptian army. You can read that in Exodus 14. What an event that had to be to see Pharaoh and his army coming right at you. There's the cloud. There's Moses with his staff. And God is ministering to Moses as Moses is praying, Lord, what do we do? And he goes, stick your staff in the, in the sea. Now, he had to have faith to do that, right? Yeah. And he did it. And the sea began to open up. And dry ground began to appear. And the walls of water, what was that? Like the greatest aquarium in the world, uh -huh. right? As they could probably see all the fish, the debris, and the seaweed, and whatever was under the water, they could see it as they were crossing through. You know, I, I often wonder if they were crossing, if they could just touch the edge of the water, you know, and just kind of see it go, whoosh, little ripples. Or could they put their hand in the water and then pull it out? I don't know. But it must have been an awesome sight to see that. And yet, they still were faithless. Verse 2 says they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud, unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. In the Greek, it, it says it this way, in my Amplified. And all were baptized or emerged in the past history by God unto Moses in the cloud by the sea. So Israel were baptized into Moses. The divided sea was not only an amazing demonstration of God's love and power and protection over them, but it also pictured the baptism by passing through the water. All of Israel were identified with Moses, and that's what he's saying here. They passed through the water, and Christians are identified with Jesus today through baptism, though it's a ritual. It's more of an identity, identifying ourselves with Jesus, identifying ourselves with Moses, because when you think about it, the fact is, the water baptism has no meaning at all. It only speaks of identification. It doesn't do anything for you. We were all buried with him by baptism, by baptism of the Holy Spirit. That is, what is baptism of the Holy Spirit? It identifies the body of Christ. It puts us into the body as members of Jesus Christ. And so, for by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. And we'll see more of this in chapter 12 when we get there. Now, how were they baptized unto Moses? Uh, don't tell me that Moses had a big baptismal event right in the middle of this situation. No, because that was not the case. Not one of them got wet. They're all on dry land, and they walked through the water. It records very clearly that they were on dry land. No, in fact, it was God who then caused the water to get Pharaoh and all of his men wet. They literally were baptized unto yeah. death. <laughs> unto death. No, they went over on dry land. The ones who really got wet were the Egyptians, and they were soaked. So obviously when he says they were baptized unto Moses, he's talking about the water. Neither is it the baptism of the Holy Spirit because they were baptized unto Moses. And so they're identifying themselves with Moses, who had the faith to trust in God. They didn't have the faith. Remember, they started complaining to Moses about it, right? It wasn't their faith. It was Moses's. When you read the Exodus story, they wanted to go back to Egypt. Why are we here? Why did you bring us here to die? Like this is a whole plan, your whole scheme, Moses, to do all these great miracles and lead us out to this place that we could die? This makes no sense. Why would you? That's so wicked, Moses. So it wasn't their faith. It was Moses' faith. And so them going through the water, is where they were identifying themselves with Moses, just like we identify ourselves with Jesus Christ who went through it all. We put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ alone. In fact, in the Old Testament, Exodus 15, uh, once they had gone through the water, they sung a song to Moses because of Moses' faith. McGee said, all of this is a picture of our salvation. Christ went through the waters of death 
and we are brought through by his death, identified with him, and now identified with the living Savior, baptized into Christ. That is the way baptism saves yes. us, because it identifies us with the one who sacrifices life for us. So we must put our faith and trust in Christ and Christ alone. That is what salvation is, right? It's faith in Jesus, not our works. That's difficult for some to understand. That alone. Somebody asked me this morning, I can't remember, like, yeah, I think it was Robert, one of the Roberts that are here. What's the difference between Catholicism and Protestants? Well, one of them believes in Christ alone that saves us. Just him, his work on the cross, that's it. It was everything that he needed to do upon that cross, take all our sins, carry them unto death, and then forgive us and wash us and cleanse us into righteousness, imputing to us the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Where in Catholicism, they say, no, it's Christ's death on the cross, but you also have to add the sacraments. You have to add other rituals in order to truly be saved, like baptism as an infant and your confirmation as you get older and have better understanding. And they add these rituals to their faith when it's really Christ alone. It has Amen. nothing to do with anything that we do. Ephesians 2.8 is very clear. For by faith, I'm sorry, by grace you have been saved. Through faith. There it is again. It's through faith. You believe that we're saved by God's favor alone. It's not of works. At least anyone can boast. Can you imagine? I was born and, and raised in Catholicism. <clears throat> and I used to literally think, well, if I go on Saturday and, and, and confess my sins to the priest, you know, and sit in the pews and say my Hail Marys and our fathers, I can go away. And I'm good with God now. Now I can start sinning again. <laughs> That's what I thought. I'm good and I'll just do it again next week. You know? And that's religion. Now, as Christians, we sometimes do the same thing. We know it's Christ alone. And we think, well, Christ has forgiven me. I confess my sins. He's therefore just to forgive me, First John 1, 9. And so now I can confess him. Now I can go ahead and sin. No, you can't. You can't. You've got to walk by faith. You have to reject the flesh that's a part of your life and give in to the Spirit of God. So water baptism illustrates this and is very important but it is merely a ritual baptism. Real baptism is a work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Look at verse 3. All ate the same spiritual food. Now he's going back to that place in Exodus 16 where they ate the manna. In the Greek it says, and all ate the manna at that time the same spiritual food. They all ate of it, guys, by the way. And he's making that point that all of them as individuals were actively involved in, in that event. In those events, whether the Red Sea, where he and the manna, whether the cloud by night, every single one of them, just like every one of us are actively involved in our relationship with Jesus Christ. All of Israel was sustained by God's miraculous provision of food, drink during the time of the wilderness, Exodus 16 and 17. And it's God's grace that provided their daily needs. This is a remarkable display of God's love and power for Israel, that he provided their daily needs but also a prefigure of the spiritual food we receive at the Lord's table. 1 Corinthians 11, which we'll get to. John 6, 47 says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. He's the bread of life. He is our spiritual bread from heaven today. He's the one that we partake of and live by. He goes on in, in in John 6, 47, he says, Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness and are dead. This is, this is Jesus Christ. Just as Paul is saying, they were dead, they were scattered. So Jesus says, they ate the manna and are dead. In other words, he's saying here, they partook of the miracles of God, and yet they had no faith in God. And so they're dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which comes down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give in my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. But the Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you'll have no life in you. 
Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last days. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me. Important line there. If you are a partaker of Christ, you abide in him. That's faith again. It's faith working. You're abiding in him. You're living for him. You haven't created your own kingdom and you're living your way. See, that's what we do, don't we? <clears throat> there's two kingdoms, God's kingdom. And then there's our kingdom, the world's kingdom. There's a satanic kingdom. And in this satanic kingdom, anything goes. Satan doesn't care what you do. As long as you stay away from his kingdom. Mm -hmm. That's all he cares about. You can walk whatever way you want. You can believe in whatever you want to believe. In fact, you can even go to church. And as long as you don't participate, as long as you don't support, he's fine with that. Because you're not activating your faith. You're just performing a religious duty. And you're just sitting there doing nothing. And that's the kingdom that the rest of the world is all in, just doing their own thing the way they think is right. They're writing their own Ten Commandments. You know, I shall love the Lord my God whenever I feel like it. I shall love the Lord my God as long as I get what I want. You know, and I'll keep holy the Sabbath day whenever I want to. Right? Whenever I want to. I'll love my neighbors as long as they're good to me. You know, I won't steal it unless it helps me out. And I really need it. You know, and you write your own Ten Commandments there. And, and they're all written based upon your emotions and your feelings because you want those things. And you even justify it in your own mind. This is, God wants me to be happy. Remember a young lady said that to me. God wants me to be happy. That's why I'm leaving my husband and, and, and dating this young high school. Because God wants me happy, right? Like, well, he wants you happy, but not that way. It doesn't work that way. But that's creating your own kingdom. In this kingdom, the lines are drawn very clearly. You love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's it. You keep holy the Sabbath day. That's it. You don't steal. That's it. Just very drawn clearly. God is, now, we're not saved by that. Now, over here, you might design and say, yeah, I'm saved by that. See, God now has to accept me because I don't ever steal. That guy can probably say, I've never stolen before, so God just must really love me. No, no. That's works, because now you're basing your relations with him on works. But here, I don't want to steal. There was a time when I would base my relationship with God on works, because of my Catholicism. I, I've always been a person that didn't like to cuss. I don't know why, but I mean, I, not that I didn't cuss, but I just didn't use vulgar language in my vocabulary a lot. Uh, when I worked for Southern California Edison and you work with journeymen's, boy, you hear some vulgar things coming out of construction workers and those kind of guys. It's amazing. And I just always felt so uncomfortable with that, saying words in front of people, and it's like, ugh. And, and so I always used to pride myself, like, I don't cuss like that. I don't do that. And it's like, God must love me a little bit more than he loves them. And that's all based on works, right? And then I realized when I came to Christ, I don't want to cuss. And God doesn't love me less or love me any more. I just don't want to cuss. It just doesn't um, set a great example of who I am as a Christian, as a believer in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to mislead people. I want people to be led to Christ and not away from Christ mm -hmm. because of my example. And it becomes a desire and a want, right? Mm -hmm. Now, that's what needs to happen in the church. It has to become a desire. How do I love someone? Well, you've got to desire it. But I don't desire it. Then you need to pray and ask God to change your heart so that I can love my enemies as hard as that is. Doesn't mean you have to have chicken with them, as Javen and McGee says, but you need to love them, not talk about them. So Jesus here is talking about these, these people who had no deeds at all, yet they walked in the midst of God himself, but they had no faith whatsoever. They ate of the bread, and yet they had no faith. And Jesus is saying, here I am the bread of life, and you can eat of me and have life, and yet still you refuse, just like the children of Israel. In verse 4 he goes on and says, Then they drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock is Christ, or was Christ. Now he's talking about the rock back then. Let me read it to you in my Amplified Greek. And they all individually drank the same spiritual drink. 
For they were drinking continually in the past from a spiritual rock which followed or preceded them, and the rock was Christ. So you get this picture that they drank every single day. Remember, they were thirsty. God says, you want water? Moses, I want you to hit the rock. Mm-hmm. And water came gushing forth. And they all drank of that water. Every day they were drinking, not a one-time thing. But every one of them had enough water to carry with them on their journey. The spiritual rock. Now Paul is building on a rabbinical tradition which said Israel was supplied with water by the same rock all through the wilderness. A rock which followed them. They believed that the rock literally, and I'm just being a little funny here, but grew legs and was literally following them along the road till they got to the promised land. That's what they believed. That somehow God miraculously let the rock continue to fall. And I can almost see, because I've seen a lot of Twilight Zone type of movies, <laughs> you know, I can see them kind of like traveling 100 miles, and all of a sudden they look behind them, and there's the rock. Wait a minute. How did it get there? It just went with them. You know, is that what happened? I don't know. It doesn't say. I'll, I'll tell you what I, I believe. I believe, as the scripture says, let me give you some scriptures, <clears throat> just so that you... I'm jumping ahead here because I I know I'm running out of time. It says in Psalm 78, He split the rock in the wilderness and gave them drink in abundance like the depths. So that's how much water there was. And you're talking millions of people. And if you look at the pictures of the rock that they have today, where they believe that Jesus was uh, at with the the children of Israel, you'll see a huge rock, huge, and it's split right down the middle. Mm -hmm. as like a little eye. And then you'll, you'll see that where the water would have came forth. And if you take an aerial view, you'll actually see like a huge lake where it could literally have, have uh, quenched millions of people. And then it just followed the stream along. So Psalm 78, the, the, he split the rock in the wilderness and gave them drink in abundance. Then 78.20 says, behold, he struck the rock so that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Streams So now we have streams from the water, streams that are being made because of so much water, right? We're all of a sudden going this way and that way and so forth. And then Psalms 105 says, he opened the rock and water gushed out. It ran in the dry places like a river. So what does it sound like? Like the water followed them in the wilderness. And I think that's what Paul is saying here, is that this spiritual rock followed them. That is, that God provided water for them all the way through the wilderness as those rivers were following them. Not the rock itself, but the rivers. Now, some believe it was a rock, and that's fine. But I think the Psalms clarifies it for us, that it was the water gushing out that just continued to flow. Uh, um, Scientifically, you could probably make a case and say it probably hit a table of water somewhere underneath the ground. That God opened it up, and it was plenty of water on there to supply for a lot, a lot of years. And it just came forth. Now, this rock was Christ. It was Christ, he says, which is Paul's point here. He's pointing to the fact of the Jews in Corinthian there that Christ walked among them just as he walks among you. Christ was present with the Israelites in the wilderness, providing for their needs miraculously. That's our Christ, that's our Savior who is our provider, whether it is water from a rock or whether it's bread from heaven, he is the one that provides for us. So we see Israel even had the presence of Christ himself in the wilderness. And Paul said Christ was the rock in the Old Testament. As he told Moses, strike the rock and water will come out that the people may drink. And then Moses did Then Moses lifted his hand in Numbers 20, struck the rock twice when God said they need more water, so strike it again. Mm. Or speak to it that time, and this time he struck it twice, which he was not supposed to do, but water came forth again, even though in the rebelliousness of Moses' anger towards the people. Yet God provided for the people. And why am I saying that? Because God is our provider. Amen. See, Paul's point is that all can partake of Christ, yet all cannot be pleasing to him. Mm-hmm. See, Christ will bless us. He'll encourage us. He'll provide for us. He'll be there for us. But we have the choice whether we'll be pleasing to him or not, whether we will have faith. 
He's the one that refreshes us with living waters. But we must choose to have faith in him as our rock. We have to eat his flesh and drink his blood. Spiritually speaking, by the way, you read John 6, continue. He says, these things I say are spiritual, not fleshly. It makes that very clear there. Because some of the disciples were like, How, we're not cannibalists. We're not going to eat your flesh. We're not going to drink your blood. <laughs> Bloodletting and drinking and having a celebrate. No, we're not doing that. Because that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about having a deep, intimate relationship with God. Partaking of his sufferings. That's what happens when you suffer. You're partaking of Christ and how he suffered. Mm -hmm. How he felt. What he went through. Christ learned obedience through his suffering. That was the humanity of Christ. What did he learn? Obedience. He learned the obedience that mankind has to learn. So he understood the obedience, the struggle of being obedient even in the midst of, of hard trials of your life. And Christ can now, as a high priest, stand there and say, I know what you're feeling. I know what it's like to suffer as you suffer. So then Paul closes up and says in verse 5, But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in so saying all of these things about how God blessed them, how God walked with them, how God provided for them, how God just, everything they needed, and yet some of them were not pleasing to God. In the Amplified, it says, Nevertheless, with most or many of them, God was not well pleased. The word pleased there means to take pleasure in, to be favorable, inclined towards. In other words, um, when you're pleasing, to someone, that someone has a sense of wanting to bless you. Uh, they want to have favor on you. You become a friend, and then when need, they're there for you because you're pleasing to them. You're, you're not horrible. You don't rub them the wrong way, kind of thing. And so in the sense, well-pleased or not well-pleased is the opposite of that, right? So what God is saying here through, through uh, Paul is that God was not well-pleased with them. In other words, he had no favor for them. He had no inclination of helping them. They wandered and they died in the wilderness. In other words, it says in, in the Greek, they were laid by God low or prostrated in the wilderness. In other words, they died with their bodies flat on the ground dead. So despite all the blessings and spiritual privileges, the Israelites in the wilderness did not please God. They should have been more appreciative of God for what he had given them but yet they weren't. Only two men we know who were appreciative, and that was Caleb and Joshua that went into the promised land with a whole new generation, but this generation went in with nothing. And this shows how far a person can go and still surrender, and still not surrender to God. You see, guys, it's by faith that we live as Christians. We have a perfect example of Judas Iscariot. Modern time, Jesus time, example of someone who walked with Jesus. Now, imagine walking with Jesus and seeing all the miracles that he performed. Yeah. Now, you would, like me, would say, oh yeah, I would believe in him completely. I don't know. There's Judas walking with him, seeing all these miracles, experiencing them. Jesus even sent them out two by two. Judas may have done some miracles. And then, what did he do? Betray Jesus. Isn't that sad? And it comes right down to it. He betrayed Jesus because he had no faith. He was faithless. He had other plans. His kingdom was here. Let's, let's raise Jesus up and he'll become our leader, Messiah. He'll take over the Roman Empire. We'll rule with him. I might sit on his right hand and we'll be kings forever. That was his plan. That's in the world. That's the disciples. Who's the greatest in the kingdom of God? I am. God's kingdom says no. I have to go to the cross and die for the sins of mankind so they can have eternal life. It's not about life here on this earth any longer. I'm the living water that's come to give them eternal life. But Judas rejected that. He chose not to believe that Christ was the true Messiah that came to die for the sins of the world. And so he was faithless. It reveals the wonderful liberty the Israelites had when they crossed the Red Sea. And yet they misused that liberty. The Mesaic law had not been given at this time, so they were not under a law at all. It was still under God's grace. And they had great liberty, but they abused that liberty just like Christians do today. We abuse the liberty that God has given to us. 
Privilege is no insurance against ultimate failure. Privilege is no insurance against ultimate failure. A rich man's son has to learn that. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. The displeasure of God with the Israelites was evident because they never entered the promised land, but died in the wilderness. I think we need to be careful at this point, guys, in our walk with Christ. There, there is a chapter in um, Hebrews that talks about um, those who have partook of Christ, who walk with Christ, who even did some miracles with Christ, and yet if they fall away, they are unable to come back to the Lord. It's chapter 6. Is he talking about someone losing their salvation? I think he's talking about somebody that never had their salvation. Because Luke chapter 8 tells us about the word of God and how the seed is planted in each individual's heart. Very clearly. And it could be that they're either the ones by the waysides and the devil comes and just takes it away and they never believed, so they're not saved. And there are Christians like that. They believe the word of God, but then the devil comes along and takes it away and they just don't want to live the life. So they walk away unsaved. Or they're the ones that it was on the word or on the rock and those who heard it received the word with joy. Isn't that interesting? You can actually receive the word with joy and yet these have no root or they're not grasped deep in the ground hanging on to. They're just on top of the surface. They're just surface believers who believe for a while and in time of temptation fall away. In time of temptation fall away. They don't believe either. Temptations comes in and they fall away. And that word time, guys, is not like a day. It can mean any amount of time. You could be walking with the Lord a lot of years. Your grandma and your mom may be walking with the Lord and praying for you. You might even be praying. You might even believe, but yet you're not doing anything for the kingdom. You're living your life doing what you want in your own little kingdom. And the temptations of this world has kept you away. The fact is, you're not really saved. There's no evidence to that whatsoever. Or it could be that the word fell on thorns. And when they have heard, they go out and are choked with cares, riches, pleasures of life. And they bring no fruit to maturity, none whatsoever. Continually, no fruit. There's no evidence of their faith in Jesus Christ. They didn't get in the wheelbarrow and say, I believe you can get me across. They just stayed on the sidelines. And there are a lot of Christians that are just on the sidelines. These are the faithless ones. These are the ones that God wants to say, wake up. Because there's still hope. See, our goal as believers is perseverance. Perseverance. To stay faithful and on track. Be committed and be loyal to the Lord Jesus Christ completely. Amen. I heard a story of a man who had been down on his luck and was desperate to make a little money. And after a few other doors had closed to him, he had the idea of going to the city zoo. Hoping to land a job feeding animals and the manager of the zoo had no openings, but seeing how big this guy was, he offered him a position saying, hey, look, our gorilla died the other day and he was one of our most popular exhibits. If, you, if we got you a special gorilla suit, would you put it on and imitate the gorilla for a few days until the gorilla arrives and we'll pay you very well for it. The man was so desperate for work, he agreed. And in fact, after a few hours, he got... Uh, he really got into the whole part, beating his chest, shaking the bars, huge crowds would gather, he'd scream and yell, and, and maybe this wasn't too bad after all, he thought. And then one day he was swinging on the trapeze, thought he saw this gorilla, and he was hanging on, and he lost his grip, and his momentum carried him right into a tall chain link fence into the middle of the lion's den. <laughs> Looking up at the intruder, at this intruder in his domain, the huge lion gave a furious roar, and the crowds were memorized. What was a gorilla to do? He cried out for help. <laughs> it would reveal his true identity. He slowly walked backwards, away from the lion, hoping to climb the fence back into his own cage. The lion, however, with a hungry look on his face, began to stalk him step by step. Finally, in desperation, the gorilla hollered, Help! 
And immediately the lion answered in an annoying whisper, shut up, stupid. You're going to get us both into trouble. <laughs> <laughs> you see, guys, things aren't always what they seem to appear. There are people today who claim to be Christians who may not even think they are Christians or who think that they are Christians, but they're not. They're not. They need to have the evidence of the Christianity, that they have works evidence. You can scream and yell all you want that you're a gorilla, but the fact is you're not a gorilla. If you're a Christian... Then where is the fruit worthy of your Christianity? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let us pray. And maybe this message touched your heart. And maybe you need to get right with Jesus. Maybe your walk is weak. And you need to commit yourself unto the Lord. I want to pray for you. Gracious Father, I, I thank you, Lord, for your precious word. Lord, and the challenges that it brings us. Even as believers, Father. And truly, that's why we're here. Because we are believers and we want to hear from you. We want to know that we're walking with you, Lord, rightly. Because a lot of us don't read our word, Lord. Sorry to say, Lord. And I need to read my word more, Lord. But Father, uh, after today's message, I, I find, Lord, that I need to have more faith in you. And not be so faithless. And so, Lord, would you give me faith? Would you help me, Lord, when trials come, when worries and cares, when the enemy confronts me, Lord, that I would have faith to trust in you completely, Lord. I can't do it in my own strength and in my own flesh. I need you, Lord Jesus, to be the one that is my anchor. Do it, Lord, please, supernaturally, Father. I surrender to you once again, Lord. And Lord, help me to show forth the works, Lord, of what a Christian is, Father. That I would change my mindset, not that I have to do these things, but that I get to and I want to. Help my mind to change, Lord. Help my heart to change, Lord. I pray again, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would cause that change within me, Lord Jesus. And Lord, if there's anyone here that does not know Jesus, they need to surrender their lives to him right now by simply saying, Lord, come into my life. Be my Savior. And don't leave me there, but work in me as I surrender to you every day, as I read and as I pray and as I continue to seek you, Lord, and you show me new things that I will change, Lord change, Father, by your Holy Spirit. Lord. Give me eternal life, I pray. Only by the work of Jesus alone. For by grace I have been saved. And it's through my faith in him and not of anything else. Otherwise I could boast, Lord. I want to trust in him completely. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand.